One of the strangest and most revealing uh, developments in the era of Donald Trump is how large parts of American liberals and even parts of the American left completely abandoned and jettisoned and often even renounced principles that had long defined left liberal politics in the United States. One of the primary views of American left liberals for decades has been the need to reform the criminal justice system based on the argument that the United States is the country that imprisons more of its citizens than any other in the world, both in terms of raw numbers and in terms of percentage of our country that is incarcerated. We are only 5% of the world's population, yet 25% of all prisoners in the world are in the United States. And the argument has always been that the system is rigged in favor of prosecutors, that prosecutors have far too many powers and there are almost no protections for criminal defendants, which is why the vast majority of criminal cases end either in a, guilt, a plea bargain of someone pleading guilty or a conviction in court. And the minute Trump became president, those principles were abandoned with things like the prosecution of Michael Flynn when he was lured by the FBI into describing without a, without a perfect memory a conversation that they eavesdropped on. They knew exactly what he said with the Russian ambassador. They tried to criminalize that using theories that the left had long denounced. And yet no one on the left had a problem with it. Many cheered it because it was Michael Flynn being prosecuted. That happened all throughout Russiagate. And it particularly happened in the prosecution of January 6th protesters, obviously, the American, American liberals have long viewed the right of political protest as a sacrosanct right, and especially when nonviolence are, is used, the idea that nonviolent political protesters or even trespassers can be charged not with a misdemeanor but a felony was unthinkable. And yet that's exactly what federal prosecutors and prosecutors in the District of Attorney in the District of Columbia have continuously done in the wake of political pressure to turn uh, a not uh, violent protesters at January 6th at the Capitol, not into people charged with misdemeanors, but into convicted felons. Now, we did a show uh, on March 1st where we described, there you see the headline, what was a major court victory for nonviolent January 6th protesters, namely, that a federal court of appeals had examined the theory, the primary theory that prosecutors invented to convert nonviolent political protest into a felony and found serious flaws in it. In sum, many of you may not remember, there was a huge scandal in the corporate world in 2001 and 2002 involving the energy company Enron. It was considered one of the great successes in the corporate world. People like Paul Krugman sat on its board. It was paid $50,000 a year to do so. Enron looked like a very profitable company, but the whole thing was a fraud and a scam. And when the whole thing collapsed and it was evident that it was a fraud and a scam, the government wanted to prosecute not only the executives of Enron, but also its accounting firm, Arthur Anderson, that had done had such a played such a vital role in helping Enron perpetrate this fraud. The problem was that there were holes in federal law that really didn't apply to the kind of hiding of information or the kind of attempts to obstruct justice that accountants at the Arthur Anderson firm engaged in. And so as a result, Congress enacted a law called the Sarbanes-Oxley Law, which was named after the two members of Congress who sponsored it, that was just designed to call it a federal offense, a felony, if you deliberately and corruptly hide information or obstruct an official proceeding, such as an investigation, of, into financial fraud. It was a very narrow statute, clearly designed to do things like be able to empower the federal government to charge people engaged in financial fraud with felonies more easily. And the law has been there since 2002, and nobody ever dreamed of using it to turn nonviolent political protesters into felonies. It had nothing to do with the enactment of this law. And what prosecutors decided to do 
was to classify the January 6th ceremony where the Congress approves the Electoral College results as though that were some kind of an investigation of an official ceremony so that people who protested there even nonviolently could be accused of obstructing it as if that was equivalent to obstruction of justice or an, inv an investigation and charge nonviolent protests with a felony. And in order to do that, ironically, it had to be characterized as some sort of official investigatory proceeding. And so they used Donald Trump's theory about January 6th, namely that it wasn't just a ceremonial event where the Congress automatically has to accept the report of the Electoral College. They decided instead to classify it as some kind of an investigation where Congress has discretion to accept or reject the results of the Electoral College so that they could call it an investigative body or an official investigative proceeding in order to squeeze in these protesters into this law that had nothing to do ever with political protesting. And so the U.S. Court of Appeals, the most important court in the D.C. Circuit after the Supreme Court on March the 1st in the case of the USA versus Larry Rendell Brock, said the following, quote, the court, the lower court, convicted Brock, he was a January 6th protester, of six crimes, including corruptly obstructing Congress's certification of the electoral court under 18 U.S.C. 1512 C2, that's the Sarbanes-Oxley law. At sentencing, the district court applied a three-level sentencing enhancement to Brock's conviction on the ground that Brock's, Brock's conduct resulted in, quote, substantial interference with the administration of justice meaning the January 6th ceremony. And then the appellate court said this, quote, we hold that the administration of justice enhancement does not apply to interference with the legislative process of certifying electoral votes. For that reason, we vacate Brock's sentence for his section 1512C2 uh, conviction and remand to the district court for resentencing. Considered in context, Congress's counting and certification of electoral votes is but the last step in a lengthy electoral certification process involving state legislatures and officials as well as Congress. Taken as a whole, the multi-step process of certifying electoral college votes, as important to our democratic system of government as it is, bears little resemblance to the traditional understanding of the administration of justice as the judicial or quasi-judicial investigation or determination of individual rights. Brock's interference with one stage of the, of the Electoral College vote counting process, while no doubt endangering our democratic processes and temporarily uh, derailing Congress's constitutional work, did not constitute interference with, quote, the administration of justice, which is the term that, that Wall Street reform law used to, again, criminalize the attempt to obstruct a investigation by the Justice Department. And that was a big blow to this core theory. They didn't nullify the conviction. They didn't say that this applies to all January 6th defendants who are convicted under this theory, but obviously it expressed serious doubts about how this law was being interpreted. The Wall Street Journal back in 2021 said the following, quote, to prosecute January 6th Capitol rioters, government tasked a novel legal strategy Quote, as first trials approach, some defendants are challenging use of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act to obtain felony convictions and stiff sentences. This was always an extreme stretch of the law. And yet few people cared because they were maniacally obsessed with punishing the January 6th protesters in the harshest way possible. Even if the law did not permit charging them with felonies, they decided to do it anyway because of the political pressure to put these people in prison, even if they didn't use violence. They used a distortion of the law, not the war itself. Finally, after all this time, an appellate court rejected that theory. Today, this case went to the, New York, the, the, to the Supreme Court, and the New York Times, obviously supportive of this overall effort to punish these January 6th defendants, was for to, forced to admit the following, quote, Supreme Court appears skeptical of using the obstruction law to charge the January 6 rioters. Quote, the justices questions consider the gravity of the assault and whether prosecutors have been stretching the law to reach members of the mob responsible for the attack. Justice Clarence Thomas, who returned to the bench in 
after an unexplained absence on Monday, like a little school child who didn't provide a sick form to school after he missed class on Monday, he asked whether the government was engaging in a kind of selective prosecution, quote, there have been many violent protests that have interfered with proceedings, he said. Has the government applied this provision to other protests? Justice Samuel Alito and Neil Gorsuch asked questions along similar lines, but the justices mostly considered whether a provision of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act enacted in the wake of the collapse of the energy giant Enron covers the conduct of a former police officer, Joseph Fisher, who participated in the Capitol assault on January 6, 2021. The law figures in two of the federal jar charges against Mr. Trump as well in his election subversion case. And more than 350 people who stormed the Capitol have been prosecuted under it. If the Supreme Court sides with Mr. Fisher and says the statute does not cover what he is accused of having done, Mr. Trump is almost certain to contend that it does not apply to his conduct either. The law signed in 2002 was prompted by accounting fraud and the destruction of documents, but the provision is written in broad terms. It did that in two-part provision. The first makes it a crime to corruptly alter, destroy, or conceal evidence to frustrate official proceedings, which obviously does not apply to the January 6th defendants. They didn't destroy anything in terms of documents part of the proceedings. The second part, says the New York Times, at issue in Mr. Fisher's case, makes it a crime, quote, otherwise to corruptly obstruct, influence, or impede any official proceeding. The heart of the case is that pivot from the first part to the second. The ordinary meaning of, quote, otherwise, prosecutors say, is, quote, in a different manner. That means, they say, that the obstruction of official proceedings need not involve the destruction of evidence. The second part, they say, is a broad catch-all applying to all sorts of conduct. Mr. Fisher's lawyers counter that the first part of the provision must inform and limit the second one to obstruction linked to the destruction of evidence. They would read otherwise, in other words, as similarly. Now, the New York Times is giving a lot of credit to this prosecutorial theory for obvious reasons than the New York Times. One of the journalists who has, in my view, covered the January 6th prosecutions in the most intrepid and tireless and well-informed way is Julie Kelly. She's like an encyclopedia for January 6th prosecutions. She has been covering the flaws in the uh, Justice Department's case, the all abuses of the prosecutors and the judges. She's been on our show before. Uh, to talk about the January 6th prosecution. There is really no journalist in the country, I believe, who is as well-informed as she is. And here's what she had to say about the oral argument. Today, uh, she appeared... Uh, let's find out whose show she appeared on. Uh, but this is what she said. Fisher v. United States. Supreme Court uh, heard oral arguments today. Before we get into where you think the judges are going, judges are going can, can you just give us background as to what's at issue here and and why it's such a big deal not just for trump but for a lot of j6 defendants right so this relates to the government's use doj's use of 1512c2 obstruction of an official proceeding statute this was passed in the wake aftermath of the enron arthur anderson scandal it has to do with evidence tampering or document shredding as we saw in that case what the DOJ has done for the first time ever is weaponize that statute to criminalize political dissent and charge now roughly 350 January 6th protesters with this felony offense punishable by up to 20 years in prison. It finally, three years later, has made it to the Supreme Court and oral arguments. Joseph Fisher was one of these defendants charged. Uh, the district court judge, Carl Nichols, is the only one who dismissed this count against him and the doj appealed that which is how now we got to the supreme court oral arguments today now just to illustrate how abusive the justice system has been to the january 6th defendants we all know that nonviolent protesters are almost never charged even violent protesters often are not there because this case is now before the supreme court because an appellate court raised questions about the interpretation there have been january 6th defendants who have gone to the judge and asked for a reduced sentence based on the doubt about whether this law can be used to prosecute them. And at least one of the judges in several cases said, I'm not reducing your sentence because even if the Supreme Court invalidates your prosecution under this law, 
I will simply increase the sentence I gave you for your conviction under a different law. In other words, I'll make them uh, consecutive instead of concurrent, and you'll end up spending the same amount of time in prison anyway. They're going to readjust retroactively to increase the sentence, even if they said the Supreme Court invalidates his prosecution. Now, just to give you a sense of some of the skepticism and hostility the court today expressed during oral arguments, I just want to show you a couple of illustrative clips. The first one is from Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts of the Supreme Court. And to come up with some atextual gloss from C1 to port over into C2, I don't understand what the court could look at to guide its determination of exactly what the relevant similarity would be. Uh, uh, General, uh, I'm sure you've had a chance to read our opinion. For- By the way, this is an exchange that Justice Chief Justice Roberts had with the Solicitor General of the United States, which is the lawyer responsible for defending the United States in before the Supreme Court. Uh, General, uh, I'm sure you've had a chance to read our opinion released Friday in the Voice in that case. It was unanimous. It was very short. Uh, (laughs) But it explained how to apply the doctrine of Houston Generous. And what it said is that specific terms, a more general catch-all, if you will, term at the end. And it said that the general phrase is controlled and defined by reference to the terms that precede it. Uh, the otherwise phrase is more general, uh, and the terms that precede it are alters, destroys, mutilates, uh, or, or con- and seals a record and document. And applying the doctrine, as was set forth in that uh, opinion, the specific terms, alters, destroy, and mutilate, carry forward into two, and the terms record, document, or other object carried, carry forward into two as well. And it seems to me that they – as I said, sort of control and define the uh, the more general term. So, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I think that the statute- I'm sorry, just to interrupt so I oh, yes. put, put out exactly what- and, and the otherwise means in other ways. It alters, destroys, and mutilates record, document, or other objects that impede the investigation and otherwise, in other ways, accomplishes the same result. So I think the problem with that approach with respect to 1512 is that it doesn't look like the typical kind of statutory phrase that consists of a parallel list of nouns or a parallel list of verbs where the court has applied a usedom generis or the noscator canon. You know, these are separate prohibitions that have their own complex, non-parallel internal structure. And I think actually the best evidence that it's hard to figure out how you would define a degree of similarity between them just based on the word otherwise is that th- there are multiple competing interpretations at issue in this case. You know, Justice Alito touched on them and they're reflected in the competing interpretations between Judge Katsis on the D.C. Circuit and Judge Nichols on the District Court. Competing interpretations of what? So, which and, and it relates to exactly the, the question you asked me, which is that Judge Nichols thought that C1 should limit t- C2 and he looked at it and said, well, the relevant thing about C1 is it deals with records, documents, and other objects. And so that means C2 should be limited only to other acts that impair physical evidence. Meanwhile, Judge Katsas looked at the specific intent requirement in C1 to take action that impairs the availability or use of the evidence, and he defined a broader gloss to put on C2 and said it should be other impairment of all other evidence. Well, they're just applying the same doctrine to different aspects of it, and I think you do that as, as well, it, it, what are the common elements? Alters, destroy, and mutilates a record or a document. You have the first few, what you're doing, and what you're doing it to. And you, and you apply both of those, in, as it said in Boisinet, controlling and defining the term that follows, so that it should involve something that's capable of alteration, destruction, and mutilation uh, uh, and in, in, with respect to a record or a document. That's, that's so how I you, actually that's don't why, even understand. When you, when you, apply that doctrine, uh, again, as we did on Friday, uh, it, uh, it responds to some of the concerns that have been raised about how broad uh, C2 is. You can't just tack it on and say, look at it as if it's standing alone. So I realize that sounds like a legalistic and semantic dispute, but it's actually crucial because the government's theory requires a interpretation of this law that would basically encompass almost any behavior. And obviously, Chief Justice Roberts, who often is a swing vote, he's not one of the most reliable right-wing judges on the court by any means. You hear him not really trying to be subtle or ambiguous about it, very clearly opposed to the government's interpretation, an interpretation of this law that has been used once again to convert hundreds of January 6th protesters 
into felons and is now being used by Jack Smith as well to add felony counts to what Donald Trump is accused of doing as part of that federal case. One more exchange. Uh, this one is from is with Neil Gorsuch, and it is also with the U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth uh, Prelogar. Uh, just to give you a sense for again the hostility that her arguments and the government's arguments in, uh, confronted when before the court today. Chose. General, if that's, if that's if that's the case, what work does authorized do on your theory? Because I think I, I would, might, as I'm hearing you, think that uh, whoever corruptly obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so stands alone. And the otherwise, I'm not hearing what work it does. Can you explain to me what work it does on your view? Yes. So the work that otherwise does is to set up the relationship between C1 and C2 and make clear that C2 does not cover the conduct that's encompassed by C1. <clears throat> now, I acknowledge that there will be. Beyond that, beyond that, beyond saying, okay, C1 does some things, and the whole rest of the universe of obstructing, impeding, or, or influencing is conducted by C2. Is that a fair summary of your view? Yes, but there was a good reason for Congress to do it this way. Oh, I, it traces to the I statutory just, yeah, history. I, I understand and, that. And I would just I, say I, that... I, if I might. Um, so so what, what does that mean for the breadth of this statute? Um, would a sit-in that disrupts a trial or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, uh, before a vote qualify for 20 years? Now, it, those are exactly the right questions. And obviously that last question very clearly referred to the behavior of Jamal Bowman on the date of the vote in Congress where he pulled the fire alarm and it delayed the proceeding. And he claimed he was doing that in order to try and get out of the door. None of his claims actually made sense. It was actually illegal. And what Justice Gorsuch is saying is that if you interpret this law to mean any kind of disruption to any sort of congressional proceeding, you're going to include all sorts of things that have been very common forms of protest in our country. There are all kinds of people who occupy the Congress who disrupt congressional proceedings in order to scream things out in the middle about all kinds of things, people who go and occupy the Congress in defense of abortion rights or who frequently disrupt hearings on war, none of these people are committed felonies and they don't, it's never been interpreted as that. By the way, the uh, comments from Julie Kelly that we played, just to give credit to the show, was from the Clay Travis and uh, Buck Sexton show. Um, but I think the key point here is that there are a few things more dangerous than what mob justice prevails. The Democrats ran on a platform of depoliticizing the Justice Department. They constantly claimed that the Justice Department was acting as the personal lawyer of Donald Trump. They were going to depoliticize it. And that these January 6th prosecutions reek of nothing but political pressure and politicized motives. You can hate the January 6th protests all you want. You can even hate the protesters, but you don't want the law being distorted and abused for any purpose because that becomes a threat to everybody and the interpretation that they are using will absolutely end up encompassing a wide range of political protests that we have long considered legal in this country and certainly not felonies. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.